I grew up in Wisconsin, and one of the things that I quite like is cheese. And so at some point, it was somewhat inevitable that I'd look into cheese in the ancient Greek and Roman world. And one of the places that it shows up earliest in literature is in the Odyssey attributed to Homer in the cave of Polyphemus. Polyphemus is the Cyclops who um, has a cave that Odysseus and his men wander into. While they're there, Polyphemus comes back with his sheep and starts to milk the sheep and then puts rennet or an enzyme from an animal into the milk from the sheep and then puts it in baskets to curdle and drain and so that he can have cheese. And Polyphemus then comes across the men of Odysseus and they don't really get along. Um, He eats a few of Odysseus's men and then Odysseus tries to get him drunk in order to carry out a plan that involves blinding the Cyclops, so that he can't tell who's going in or out except by touch. And so here we have Odysseus tying himself and his men to the sheep or rams, and then the Cyclops just has to feel the sheep leaving the cave in order to forage for food. And so you can tell from this example that Polyphemus isn't quite like a lot of the Greek people. He lives in a cave. He is a shepherd instead of growing his own food, and he doesn't live in a house that he built. He also eats humans, as opposed to the Greeks who rely on grain and wine and olive oil for most of their diet. So he's sort of not Greek at all, and He lives off on his own. There's other Cyclopses that live near him who don't really exist in any sort of government with him. They're all just kind of independent people. So he's kind of this opposite of Greek civilization. And one of the things to sort of mark him out as not Greek is also that he eats cheese. And cheese is really not something that's terribly popular with a lot of Greek and Roman authors. In fact, there's not that much about them. And so I'm going to tell you about two other sources that discuss cheese extensively, or at length, and even there it's not really that long. The other author that talks about them a lot is Lucius Junius Moderatus Columella, who wrote a book De Re Rustica in the first century AD. And in his manual about how to farm, how to manage things on your estate, he talks about how to raise sheep, and then he interrupts himself to talk about cheese. And his method of cheese making is actually very similar to a method of making cheese that you can do at your own home. And here I'll be showing you how to make some ricotta cheese using the same method that you can do at your own house. In this ricotta cheese, I used whole milk for that you can see me here pouring into this pot. And the Romans or Greeks would have used a similar pot um, that could hold everything. It doesn't really matter how much you make. I'm using the whole gallon of whole milk um, that's coming from cows instead of sheep. So it's going to be a slightly different cheese, but it's the same basic principle. So Columella tells you to get the milk from your sheep. Um, You can either take it to market and sell the milk or you can make cheese from pure milk, which is why I was using whole milk here and use it as fresh as possible. Once you've put all of the milk into the pot, um, you can heat it up. And you want to bring it to a boil to make your ricotta. 
and Columella says that a pail when it has been filled with milk should always be kept at some degree of heat. It should not, however, be brought into contact with the flames, as some people think it proper to do, but it should be put to stand not far from the fire, and when the liquid has thickened, it should immediately be transferred to wicker vessels or baskets or molds. And so what he's saying is you should heat it up and then thicken it um, after you add in rennet. Again, that's the enzyme in I'll talk about what you can use instead of rennet for this. Um, so he wants you to heat it up. For ricotta, I bring the cheese to a, or the milk to a boil. Since bringing the milk to a boil takes a while, you want to keep stirring your pot so that you don't burn the bottom. There will probably be a little bit of burned milk at the bottom, but the more burned liquid you can avoid at the bottom, the better. Once the milk is brought to a boil, then you want to add, for Columella, the rennet, or for the ricotta following the recipe that I'm describing, you would want to add just a light acid. And that light acid could be a vinegar or a uh, lemon juice. It doesn't have to be that much. Um, what um, Columella says for the amount of acid or rennet that you want to add is a silver denarius. So that's about four grams of liquid or four milliliters of liquid. So not all that much that you're adding to this. And then you're going to stir it around in order to curdle the milk. So as Columella said, to make it more solid. And then he says you should add it to a mold or to a wicker vessel or basket. Instead of a wicker basket or mold, what you can use is this. I have a cheesecloth or here it's a flour sack cloth. It's not quite as um, neat as cheesecloth. And I have it over a colander or sieve so that all of the liquid can dry. You need to separate all of the liquid from the solid matter. You could do, as Columella suggests, place weights on top of it so that the whey may be pressed out. Or what you can do is twist the cloth so that it's sort of squeezing the liquid out. And then once you have all of that liquid out, you can put it into a bowl and it's a nice sort of chunky, smooth-ish cheese, your nice ricotta cheese. And that's basically what Columella describes for the cheese that you can make from sheep's milk. And that's really all he has to say about cheese. The other author that tells us a lot about cheese is Gaius Plinius Secundus, or Pliny the Elder. And he wrote the Historia Naturalis, or Natural History, which is essentially an encyclopedia where he's trying to collect almost the world's entire bit of knowledge. And he is describing different types of animals and different parts of animals, their blood of animals, and then um, animals that provide milk. And then he talks about cheese in book 11 of his Historia Naturalis. And the way he talks about the cheese is he's talking about the best cheeses that can be found in Rome. And he says that the best of those is the ones that come from the district of Nîmes in southern France from the villages of La Lozère and Gavaudan. And that's really good when it's fresh. There's also really good cheese from the Alps um, and other cheeses that are good from the Dalmatian mountains. And due to ancient geography, they thought those were much more connected than 
um, we do today. And then there were also a lot of good cheeses from the Apennine Mountains in Italy. The um, Ligurian region provides some good cheese from sheep's milk. Um, also, there's some good cheeses from Umbria and uh, the Luni cheese from the borderland between Tuscany and Liguria, or Etruria and Liguria. And that can be good for up to a thousand pounds of cheese. But there's also really good cheese from near Rome in the uh, Kydikian plains, which may actually be closer to Campania or Naples there. And then there's also some good cheeses that can be made from goats found in Gaul or Bithynia. And what you notice about all of these places that I've mentioned, or you might have noticed, is that they're all mountainous regions because this is where the sheep would be raised, that the lower plains would be used for wheat or for barley or legumes like beans or peas, or they could be used for olive oil or vineyards. But the rockier mountains would be much better for a pastoral living with sheep and goats that are being herded around. And sometimes they may have to migrate from one part of the Apennine Mountains to another part of the Apennine Mountains. And this gives the impression that these shepherds are not very settled, that they're more migratory and so they're not living in cities. They may have sanctuaries that they go back to a lot, but they're not living in cities quite as much as the Romans. And so the Romans and the Greeks think of these shepherds as less civilized and less cultured. And so they don't look upon all of the products uh, and habits of the shepherds as quite as good as their own in the cities. And so that's another reason why, despite our love of cheese, the Romans didn't quite look upon it as favorably as we did. Pliny shows us that they did like the cheese. Um, they did have different types of cheese that they liked from each of these regions, but they aren't quite as good or not looked upon quite as well as we see cheese today, or certainly not as much as the people who grew up in Wisconsin, like me.